This is referred to as, as the least restrictive plenary session. But do stay. Um, they've come. Right. Um, what, I, what I wanted to um, do is just think about um, what we mean by the principle of, of least restriction. Um, this is you at the moment. They're still leaving. Um, what would the least restrictive plenary session look like? Well, essentially, it'd be absolute chaos without rules, without limits. And it, it's interesting because when we, we look at the principles, and essentially what I want to try and do is just tie everything from the day um, together. When we look at the code and we look at the principles, it all looks very good on paper. Let me just give you one example. If under exceptional circumstances, says the code, a patient is being transported out of area, well, that's not very exceptional, is it? <laughs> Commissioners should consider whether they can provide any additional assistance as part of the care package to support any carers to visit and contact the patient and or encourage the carer to have an assessment particularly where this involves a child or young person. And it talks about how commissioners should consider providing financial assistance to support family members to maintain contact with their loved ones when they are placed out of area. Well, that sounds fine, but the point was made this morning by Chris Pearson. Look at this bit of the code. Page 13, unlucky for all of us. The code will not be statutory guidance, but will nevertheless be beneficial for commissioners. In other words, all of us, when we're practicing under the Mental Health Act, must follow this code. Unless we've got a very cogent reason not to, we must follow this code. But commissioners are not in the same camp. They don't have to. Now, why is it that the single most important person, player, in the mental health out world is not bound by the same code as the rest of us? How on earth can that be defended? So, these are the principles. Got an acronym for you. I've always got an acronym for something. Do not repel them. Okay, they are there for us to use. And I think Sarah made the, the key point this morning that these principles are spot on. But those with learning disability, mental health, autism, are wallowing outside their reach. And the whole point really of today is to do whatever we can to make these principles a reality. So respect and dignity. We've heard this morning Lots of examples of cases where there has been a complete lack of respect, a complete lack of dignity. I think Connor's case, Connor's tragedy, illustrates the risks of not treating families with respect and dignity. When a mother tells you that their loved one has had a reaction to a change in medication, that is not a complaint. That is a basic worry. And expressing worries to care providers should not make you a complainant. It makes you a caring family member. And what's also worrying about what Sarah was describing was that Connor was on a section two. And yet, it was only last night that she first met an AMP. Why was the AMP not on the scene? We've heard about Os Operation Jasmine, Winterbourne View, the fact that residents were given one incontinence pad per day, the fact that one crate of milk was being provided rather than three. Where is the respect and where is the dignity? 
When we look at the other principles, the second being empowerment and involvement. Empowering people is an absolutely critical principle to challenge the danger of those with mental health being seen somehow as non-human, as Sarah referred to. Think back to the individual that Norman was describing. I can call him Norman. <laughs> We're good mates. <laughs> I would never say that to his face. Right. Um, he was talking about the 15-year-old girl. Do you remember that this morning? She was being kept in seclusion. And there was nothing in that room apart from a padded bench. And he said that her behavior was a response to being treated like an animal. Empowerment and involvement involves not just involving the person. It means involving the family. But he was describing how her family waited months before finding out who was commissioning that supposed care. And if we also think about what Alex was talking about in the context of fusion, there's over twice as many references to mental capacity, he said, in the 2015 code as compared to the 2008 code. And one thing we might, might want to consider is whether the Mental Capacity Act approach would lead to greater empowerment and greater involvement. For example, we have no assumption of capacity under the Mental Health Act. Think about how empowering it would be to have that assumption. And then we get on to purpose and effectiveness. Well, I think this issue is best encapsulated really by what Tom was saying. He, when he made a comment earlier on, he said that there's an assumption that using the Mental Health Act means losing something, that there's some sort of loss. But we use it, he said, because we think we are benefiting people. In other words, in the longer term, using this legislation, we hope it will make them better. So the purpose is key. In terms of effectiveness, his focus, of course, was on the extent to which CTOs are effective. And the evidence seems to be that at least if you measure effectiveness by readmission rates, they are completely ineffective. And then Norman Lamb talked about the finances in terms of equity and efficiency. He talked about how only 11% of the NHS budget goes to mental health, despite mental health forming 23% of the total disease burden. He talked about waiting times, those with mental health losing out. He talked about a family that had to wait three years for a diagnosis of autism. Even in his own family, he told us, that it would take six months, had he not gone privately, it would have taken six months for his son to have treatment. And things must be pretty bad when an MP is being told that, let alone anyone else. So there is a complete lack of equal treatment and parity. Now one thing that's only briefly been mentioned today is the last principle. So this is the one that, that I really want to focus on, the principle of least restriction and maximizing independence. We use this a lot, this concept. But what does it mean? Well, restriction, I found, comes from the Latin restrictivus, which means tending to halt or prevent the flow of body fluids. Now, I'm not quite sure what bodily fluids the Romans had in mind there, I don't know if we're talking about medicine or some kind of weird sadomasochism. But halting bodily fluids is what the origin of the term um, is based on. So, so focusing on something that restricts, that has the nature or effects of a restriction, that limits the scope of someone to act. And the roots of this fifth principle are very much based in the philosophy that our interests are best served by allowing us maximum freedom and responsibility 
to pursue our own way of life. And if you look at the code, restrictive is mentioned 173 times, and least or less restrictive is mentioned 72. So it, it is a term that we are using a lot in terms of best practice. And in the past, I think, it made sense. If you look at the way it's phrased, where it is possible to treat a patient safely and lawfully without detaining them under the Mental Health Act, the patient should not be detained. And that was the origin, really, of the principle in mental health practice. It is less restrictive not to detain. And hence why we were always pursuing where we could in formal admission. But of course, the redefinition of Cheshire West has completely changed the face of that because now, in many respects, wherever you are, it is difficult to say that you are not detained. <laughs> not that I'm bitter <laughs> about losing that case. <laughs> Buggers. Right. And you know, if you think about it, well, what is less restrictive? Is it physical restraint or is it sedation? If something has to be used, if something is necessary, which of those two is less restrictive? Now, you might think that medication is more restrictive because you're altering the way the mind is working. But conversely, someone with medication might be able to lead, ultimately, a life with a greater degree of freedom outside an institution. So how on earth are we measuring what is less restrictive? One of the questions that was raised this morning was, well, which is less restrictive, doles or the Mental Health Act? Well, if you think that doles is less restrictive, but the patient is going to have to wait for six months whilst the backlog is cleared, and they're unlawfully detained in the interim, does it feel right to use the Mental Health Act in that context? Does it feel right to use something which you've decided is more restrictive, but at least it means that the person gets some form of safeguards? And I think, and you'll know this from the case law, there is an assumption that doles is less restrictive. But it isn't, I suspect. To be fair to the judges, even in the AM and SLAM case, Justice Charles says that an authorization of detention under doles will not inevitably, inevitably be less restrictive. But again, what do we mean by least restriction? We restrict ourselves all the time. You're restricted now. You restrict yourself when you go to work, when you travel, when you decide who to have contact with, when you get married. <laughs> that is the ultimate restriction. But why do we do it? Well, we do it for some greater good. We do it because the ultimate purpose is something that we want to achieve. But what worries me, especially in the context of austerity, is that to interpret the principle of least restriction as the right to be left alone, to fend for oneself, brings with it a real risk of neglect. What you can see here might be the least restrictive option, but surely it is something that we should not be pursuing. So how do we measure it? Duration. Location, prospects of recovery, degree of safeguards, degree of autonomy, stigma. Maybe those are some of the kind of yardsticks we can use when we're working out how to behave in a way that is less restrictive. But ultimately, we use this term all the time. And except for that issue about should the person be detained or not, we are really struggling, I think, to define with any sort of precision what the least restrictive option is. But then do we need to? That is one of five principles 
surely we should be considering it along with the other four. And I think if one thing has stuck out for me at least today, it is the fact that whether or not someone needs to be in hospital depends on how good the services are in the community. It's as simple as that. So, what does success look like? What does achieving the principles look like? Well, I would suggest that the best image of hope is encapsulated, really, by where we began the day. And that is with Laughing Boy himself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neil.